Hi, I'm Jim and this is Jim's Fix-It Shop and today I'm going to try to put this chain case together. I got all my parts laying around here somewhere. Um, first thing I want to do is personally I use 80-90 gear lube in my differential and my chain cases. But you, there are some things you have to do or it's going to leak on you. And the first thing that I always do is these little vent holes, for some reason they put them in there, I weld them shut. You can see I got some of the paint removed. I got to finish getting that paint off of there. Because if you don't, that's really going to mess up your weld. I don't know what kind of paint this is. If it's powder coat, that does not agree with welding at all. It really messes your welding up. So what I want to do now is try to get the rest of that paint off. I use this little right angle die grinder with a wire brush on it. And it seems to work quite well. I could use a little more hose. I'm going to finish wire brushing this and then we're going to try to weld it. It's a little noisy. Well, that doesn't look too bad. You can't really mess this part up because you're going to paint it again anyway and you're never going to see that. So now we'll go over and see if we can weld this a little bit. And I don't know how welding is going to look on this camera, but we'll give it a shot. Uh, I'll try out my new red welder. It can't say a name. I can't tell you it's a Lincoln. I bought one at the shop. It's a blue one. I can't tell you that's a Miller. But this one is a little bigger than the one I bought at the shop. The shop's machine only wire welds or MIG welds. This one will MIG weld, it will stick weld, and it will TIG weld. And I can weld aluminum with this one. I got a spool gun with it. So it was. It all come in a package and uh, hopefully it's going to work out quite well for when I start crafts this summer. And a lot of confusion on this. I'll probably do a separate video just to say this again. I am not going to stop doing crafts, craftsmen. Stop doing snapper videos. I have too many people out there with too many questions and needs too much help. So I am going to continue doing snapper videos and answering questions. It's just that I want to try to get into back into some of my woodworking and craft projects. So let's go over here and see what this welder will do. Okay, let's give this a shot and see what happens. Now, once I start welding, I don't know if it's me or everybody or just you got to have a $500 helmet, which this isn't, to uh, be able to see what you're doing. But once you start welding, it creates uh, a very bright arc and your helmet darkens. And when that happens, you can't see where you're welding. So I've got a very bright light up here I use to help me see where I'm going. So I don't know how this is going to come out, so let's just see what happens.
And that's it. That's all you got to do is a couple little tacks, one on each side of that V. And that is permanently sealed. I can check with this light. I don't see any light through there anymore, so let's go back over to the bench. All right, now we're going to put the new roller bearings in here. Here's the, there's the weld. Nothing pretty, it's just got to plug that darn hole. Um, I have a problem with this on the way I used to use this uh, set that I made for putting the roller bearings and the ball bearings in here. The spot they have flared out on here when they stamp this that holds the bearing on this one is nice and flat and it lays good on a surface this one is not it's cut on quite an angle and if i lay that on this steel plate that i made let me drop this back down there that's better and yes i'm back in red Had a lot of comments about this red shirt um, so, to get this so I can press this bearing in square and get it at the right depth, this tool I made, I used to have, some of you guys borrowed this set, a uh, set screw in it. So when you press the bearing in, the set screw hits the steel plate and stops this bearing at the right depth. Uh, you can push these bearings right on through. There's nothing to stop them. But you have to have them in at the right depth to make this thing set in there correctly. This is the uh, hexagon tube goes through here, or shaft. And then you have these little thrust washers. And it's kind of clever how they came up with this idea because what they're doing is they're hiding that weld so the weld doesn't rub on the edge of the bearing this plastic thrust washer does it's hollow inside and it goes right over top that weld and it fits in here and rubs up against that bushing or the edge of the bearing with this put together and no gasket it has about a sixteenth of an inch play back and forth when you get the gasket in there, which is, well, that's not a sixteenth, it's probably a thirty-second there, you're going to have about a sixteenth of an inch play. That's fine. The chain will guide the sprocket and hold it where it wants to be. So what we did to alleviate this problem with this angle on the edge of this um, mounting surface we're going to use this spacer so then we had to put a longer bolt for a stop in here what you want to do is you put this in your old bearing and you hold it level you put this spacer on then you take something straight I use a scale and you set it on here it should touch the edge of the spacer and the end of the bolt at the same time and it should do that on both bearings they should have them in at the same depth that holds the sprocket in the center of the chain case and it is you could get your same spacing if you shove this one flush on the inside and had this one sticking way in but what that would do is it would throw the sprocket off center it would shove it over which would make the chain wear the side of the sprocket out you want a little play in there and the sprocket will guide itself where it wants to be the bottom sprocket is held in 
pretty solid. It stays in one position because it has shoulders and that's what guides the chain. Okay, let's go over to the drill press. We're going to press these old ones out and we're going to put these new ones in. I'll cut these packages open and have that ready. Um, this bearing and any other bearing that you use when you buy them new, you don't want to open them before you're going to use them. All bearings today are pre-lubricated for life. You do not have to grease a bearing. That goes along with the bearings in your uh, deck for your spindle. A lot of spindles have grease fittings on them. You put new bearings in there, you don't need to ever grease that. The bearings are already pre-greased. So let's run over to the drill press. Okay, let's try to press these old ones out. Now you want to make sure you have this supported properly. You don't want to distort or bend this frame. Some of these are in a whole lot tighter than others. Well, that's the old ones. Now we'll pop the new ones in. I'll make sure we got that in the right spot. Put this in. Put the bearing up on that if it'll stay up there, which it doesn't want to. And you can tell when the bolt hits the steel plate. You don't want to use a piece of wood. You want to use a steel plate for assembling the bearings. And I don't know if you can see in there or not, but these are pre-greased. You don't have to do anything to them. I want to make sure the bearing goes on the tool so it's going in squarely. And that's all there is to it. Now let's go back over to the bench. Okay, let's put this thing back together, huh? I'm not going to put it any Permatex on the gasket at this time because I want to do some painting on it. You can see they missed a lot of paint here. I got to repaint that. And they missed a lot of paint around this side. I want to get some paint on that. And I don't know if I'm going to have to crack it back open to do that. I'd like to just tape it up and paint it all assembled. Now this is what they, they call this a sprocket and hub. This one is your sprocket and shaft. Now on the end of this sprocket and shaft there is what they call a what I call I don't know what they call it a wavy washer and if you look at it it's actually has it's kinked it's wavy and what that actually is is a spring and it goes on the short end of the shaft that pushes up against the inner race of the bearing and it if there's any slop on the fit between the two bearings this has two hubs on it and the bearings are go tight against these hubs it shoves the shaft one way and when you put your clutch assembly and stuff on here it's going to pull it that way anyway when you tighten up that big nut 
So let's throw this thing together. Oh, let me grab one more thing. Okay. They call this a washer slash shim. I call it a wavy washer because that's what it's for. It's a spring. Now this goes through the side of the cover with the fill plug and the, uh, I don't know what you want to call these, just the bosses sticking out that the cable, brake cable hooks in this one and your linkage bolts on this one. That goes through and it's flush. If you stuck that through the other way, your clutch would have to be out here and it's going to hit all this stuff. So there's only one way it can go on. Now we'll put the chain on. I've showed you how to check them before to see how sloppy they are. We'll put the chain on this sprocket. We may have to put them both in at once. Because these chains don't flex all that great. wavy washer fell off. Fell off again. I want to grab something. I forgot I want to put some of this on the O-rings. This is Dowell Corning 55 O-ring lubricant. It helps when you're assembling and it also makes the O-rings swell slightly. It helps them to seal better. So we're going to put a little bit of that. You don't, a tube like this will last you forever. We're going to put some, and these are, both of these are new O-rings. We're going to put a little bit on this one. And a little bit on this one. I don't want it leaking. Now I get my little washer. Maybe that stuff will help hold that in place. And we want to put this in here like this. Get this thing out of my way. almost have to push both of them in at once. Get this other little spacer on there. And we can lay the gasket in place. That way we can actually tell how much slop we have on that top sprocket. I will be cracking this open later and putting Permatex on both of those, both sides of that gasket. And we're just going to put a couple of these screws in because I don't think you want to watch me put in all these screws. Oh, for some reason I was thinking this had 13 screws. <laughs> we went over that before. <laughs> Little superstitious people out there. Now that this is together, the chain's on it, it does move back and forth a little bit. Looks like I might have a little more than a sixteenth, but it will find its own place when this starts spinning. Now I had a viewer that wanted to know where this spring went 
that keeps your brake from rattling. Well, we're going to hook that up and show them. But I need to grab my clutch disc assembly. Okay, this is kind of a handful to get this spring on right. You take your, your brake lever and you've got a bolt and a little piece of tubing or a piece of pipe that goes in here. What that does, it acts as a shoulder bolt and you can tighten this up and your brake lever will still move and so will the spring. The spring goes on the back side of your brake lever. Push your bolt through with your little piece of pipe on it. I don't know if I can get any closer or not. <clears throat> then uh, two ends of this spring, one has a bend in it like, like a hook, I guess. And the other end has a really weird little bend, kind of like you'd see on your uh, cable that accelerates your engine that you hook into your uh, block on your engine. Okay, this little, this end here with the hook goes over the brake lever. It goes right up against, right up against there. And then it slips over that little piece of tubing. Then, on your chain case, you can't hardly see it, but right down under here, there's a hole. The end of that spring goes in that hole. Then you put the bolt through this bigger hole and the nut on the back side. Just kind of, good luck, you kind of wind that in there. And you got to make sure you don't pinch the spring between the case and that little tube. That's where mine is stuck right now. Like I said, it's, it's a handful to get it in there. You might have to take this apart a couple times. But you want to hold that spring on that tube and then try to get, <laughs> try to get that bolt in there. There you go. Now you put the nut, and this is a self-locking nut, you put on the back side. Now, if you look down in there, you can see the spring is around the tube. It's not pinch. And then that's how the spring works. If you have any trouble, give me a send me an email. Then the cable hooks up here and goes down that little plastic tube with the um, with the spring inside of it that slides up through this hole, and then this little this little snap ring goes on the end of that tube. Now you have to be careful. I had a viewer that that snap ring was not holding good, and he pinched it a little tighter and it broke the end off that little tube. You cannot replace or buy that tube. You have to buy the whole brake cable again. And I've had another viewer that lost his clip. And he said, "My, it keeps falling out. What's the matter? Well, I sent him some pictures and showed him this little clip on there. Well, he went down and bought a, the smallest little hose clamp you can find and he put that around there, says it works great. So either one or the other, give it a try. Now that we got the brake on here, you've got two Belleville washers. I call them coned or cupped washers. You put the first one on with the cup side up, like a bowl. Then you put your woodruff key in this slot. You got to put that washer on there first because once you put this key in there, washer's not going to go on. 
and just take a pair of pliers and press that in there the best you can. Then your clutch disc assembly goes on. Then you put another Belleville washer in. This time the cup goes down. Then you put your self-locking nut on. What these cupped washers are is their old school lock washer. That's all they're made for. And supposedly the theory is they're a piece of spring steel. One's cupped up, one's cupped down. And it's pinching your uh, clutch assembly. So if the nut starts to come loose a little, the spring from them two washers maintain the grip on this clutch assembly and keeps it tight. They can still come loose, that's why industry got away from them and they come out with a much better washer. They're thicker, they have teeth on them, they hook together and they ratchet. So when you tighten them, the teeth on the top dig into the nut. There's teeth on the bottom one that digs into the case and then the teeth between the two ratchet and they'll slip past each other as you're tightening the nut, but they won't go backwards. So it's the new industry standard. I can't remember what they're called. I don't use them. But that's the chain case. You tighten this nut up and you're done. This is the linkage that goes on the chain case. I don't want to put that on right now because I'm going to paint this thing a little bit. Get some of them bald spots taken care of. If you have any questions or comments, send me an email or put them in the little box below. Either way, I answer my emails. It might take me a while because I get a bunch of them. I'm trying to answer... Well, I answer them nightly. I, I sometimes don't get them all done, but basically within three or four days, I'll answer your email. I know a lot of guys, you're in a hurry to get these things together, so I go through these emails as fast as I can and try to answer all of them. So that's it for the chain case. Next video probably is going to be putting a differential together. That's not, I don't think that's as complicated as trying to get that spring on that brake lever. Why they use that? I've had some people say that they can hear that rattling in there. The old ones, my old snapper never had that spring on it. There's two different style springs. Um, my old one never had a spring, and I couldn't hear that brake lever rattling in there, but I guess some people complain, and they took care of that problem. Don't forget to subscribe. I really need subscribers. If you watch these videos, you enjoy them, they help you, they save you money, push that subscribe button. It costs you nothing. It's totally free to subscribe. If you don't have an email account, they're going to ask you to set one up. That's free. Um, the only reason they want you to have an email is because when you subscribe to my channel, a bell will appear. If you touch that bell, you will be notified through your email every time I upload a video. If you don't want to be bothered, shut the bell off. When you touch it, quotations will show up. Then you know it's on. It'll also say something. Or you can touch it, they'll disappear. It'll tell you that you shut it off and you won't be bothered. You can just check when you want to. But it really does help me. Someday maybe I'll start getting some money from Google 
for the commercials they're putting on my videos if I get enough subscribers. And maybe it'll actually help support this channel. I do not accept donations and I don't ask for them right now. Maybe someday when I retire, I'll have to. But for right now, I don't charge anyone anything. I do have people that send me things. I just got something in the mail the other day and that's going to go on my snapper when it's done. And I'll, I'll explain it at that point and I'll tell you who sent it to me. So I guess that's it for now. Work safe, have fun, and if you have any questions, please let me know. And we'll talk to you soon. So long.